Hi, I'm Anjali Crochet, and you have just popped into the World Building Wakanda Beyond the Comics panel. And I am so excited to serve as your moderator today with some incredible panelists that we are all going to bring in shortly, including Evan Narciss, Cherie Renee Thomas, Frederick Joseph, and Tara Mahorn, who have all written parts of the incredible world that is Wakanda um, from different perspectives um, with different formats and they all have this incredible love and knowledge of what has become a literal international icon, a phenomenon. Um, I can't say more about it. So I would love to go ahead and bring our panelists on in uh, to the panel uh, and get started. Not to waste any time, because I know we got a lot of panelists and they got a lot to say. Also, lip gloss is perfect today, Karen <laughs> Horn. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so much amazing, gorgeous brownness on a Sunday morning. I'm very excited. Uh, so I want to take a moment. Each one of these incredible folks have and y'all bios are long like I know y'all gave short bios but I also know uh most of y'all very personally and it leaves out other things that I know you have done in this wonderful life but for folks who may not be familiar with your work I'd love for each one of you to kind of start off um with who you are how you got into comics and um why you think you're on this panel <laughs> Uh, we'll start off with Evan. Um, wow. I'm going to take the last <laughs> one first. Why I think I'm on this panel? Because I said yes. Um, no, seriously. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I've, I've um, written a, a decent amount of um, Black Panther and Wakanda stories. Um, how I got into comics? Uh, by learning how to read. Um, I learned to read off comics um, as early as like five or six. And um, um, I've had a career as a journalist and critic. Um, I'm currently a narrative game designer working at Brass Line Entertainment on a game that I can't talk about, so don't ask, but it's going to be dope if we do it right. Um, in terms of my comics uh, resume, I've written Rise of the Black Panther, um, um, uh, which ta Coates consulted on. Um, I've written uh, parts of the Wakanda miniseries that just wrapped up from Marvel. I'm showing the history of the Black Panther specifically. Um, what else have I written? I wrote uh, Last Annihilation Wakanda um, and um, Wakanda oh, Atlas. Wakanda. I yeah, I was getting there, Horn. Wakanda thank you. Atlas. Thank you. It's a lot. It's a lot. It um, is. Uh, this is why yeah. I didn't read your bio. See, this here. This yeah, is the reason. Yeah. So you could put us on blast for forgetting what we've done. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Wakanda Atlas. Yeah, as you, I, had, I, was, I had the prompt and I forgot. Yeah, I think that's everything I've written for Black Panther. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm on this panel. Love it. Love it. Um, we're going to move down to Cherie Renee with this amazing, glorious crown. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cherie Renee Thomas. And um, I think I'm on this panel because not only did I say yes and thank you, but um, I wrote a, a novel adaptation of the original Black Panther arc that Don McGregor created with Rich Buckler and the wonderful Billy Graham. It's called Panther's Rage. And so I did the novelization of that for Marvel. I also wrote um, a novelette called Heart of a Panther for the first anthology of stories based on the Black Panther, uh, Tales of Wakanda that was edited by Jesse Holland. Yep, and I came to comics um, again, that would probably be through my grandparents, um, but the comics were originally watching um, them on TV, right? And then having um, a sense of, you know, you have to go to get the comics, right? And them telling me, oh, you're going to the library. <laughs> so I wasn't able to be the traditional comics book, you know, there with the trunks full of comics. Um, but the first black superhero I knew of was the Black Panther. Um, so that was pretty, pretty early in terms of my fascination and love of all things T'Challa and all things Wakanda. I love how that came full circle for you too. <laughs> like that's, um, 
Fred Joseph. Uh, I guess I'll answer the last question first. Um, you know, because the two of you keep on inviting me to do really cool shit. I don't, <laughs> I don't and I, you know, you know, that's that's what my sisters do. Um, but I think specifically, um, why tied to Wakanda? So it's interesting. Um, I have a very interesting history, I suppose, with Black Panther. Um, most recently, I actually got the wonderful opportunity once again, thanks to you two brilliant, brilliant Black women, uh, to write the intro for Marvel Voices Wakanda Forever number one. Um, so for those who haven't read that yet, please go read that. Um, the stories in it are phenomenal. Uh, Karima, wink, wink. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, and prior, prior to that, um, a few months ago, um, uh, my picture book, uh, my first picture book, actually, um, Wakanda Forever, The Courage to Dream, um, came out, which is a tie-in actually to the Wakanda Forever film. Um, and along the way, I actually started my career, I guess, public facing career with the first Black Panther film, um, did some philanthropic things to tie into that film. And, it opened me up to a public life where I've gotten to write books and articles and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's did why. Did you just did you just downplay the Wakanda challenge? Did you just like say some philanthropic <laughs> thing? Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you said it. I did, I was about did to you do, like... did you just like downplay like sending thousands? Yeah, I mean, of you know, it's just... to go see the movie and helping the movie become uh, near and dear to their hearts for like a whole new generation. Well, I mean, look, we, I, look, I, look, I'm old. Maybe I forgot, you know. Um, so for those who, I guess, who don't know, um, I, I created a campaign to send, to send kids to see the Black Panther film. It actually ended up becoming the largest GoFundMe in history. And we sent 700,000 kids to see the film worldwide for free. So. There we go. That was just that. <laughs> um. Don't worry, I'm coming for all of you and how amazing you are. You will all get your flowers before this is over. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, my sister from another, Mr. Karen Mahorn. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Karen Mahorn, aka The Blurred Girl. Um, I am a culture journalist and critic. Um, I write a lot of actually like book reviews and movie reviews. Uh, I'm sorry, movie reviews and TV reviews. I shouldn't say books. I wrote a book. Um, Protectors of Wakanda. I did. Thank you. Um, it is a prose novel called Protectors of Wakanda, a history and training manual of the Dora Milaje. That is the origin story of the Dora Milaje. And it came out last year, which is so strange because it feels like it was sooner than that. But I guess that's what happens with your first book. Um, it takes over your life and then it's gone. Um, so yeah, I'm the I'm the newbie book writer and the newbie comic book writer on the panel. And I also am on the planning committee of Virtuous Con. So I'm also very thankful that everybody was able to join us on this panel. And yes, as Fred mentioned, I wrote uh, my first comic book story is in um, Marvel Voices Wakanda Forever, which is out now. But that's actually not the first time I wrote for Marvel. I've actually written in kind of like what Fred did, um, Thanks, Angelique. I actually got a chance to write a couple of intros to previous Marvel Voices comics. And I also wrote, I have a piece up on marvel.com um, all about Isaiah Bradley, which is funny because it was on my site and I was asked, hey, you want to maybe talk about that on our site? And that's how I knew he was going to be in Falcon and Winter Soldier. That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> There's but, always um, breadcrumbs. There is. Um, but uh, I started by talking about comics and talking about the creators behind comics, both in both indie and um, Marvel and DC and, you know, and big two. And that's kind of how I started the Blurred Girl, just really yelling about there's are Black folks creating comics, writing, drawing it, that are, and we don't, just do one thing. I know people who have written, like, like you, Sheree, have written novels in the sci-fi space as well as comics, as well as, you know, um, other fantasy uh, genres. Same with you, Evan, because you're, you know, a, a game narrator also. He's also kind of leaving out the fact that he also wrote for the Spider-Man Marvel 
uh, game that we all play. I, I'm still convinced that the Bodega Cat. You can, you can say Miles's name out loud. Miles. Miles. Okay, Morales. so yeah. Miles Morales, Spider Man. Yeah, I don't, but it's got a long name. I don't want to butcher it. Yes, I, yes. Honestly, I just tell everybody that you are responsible for the Bodega Cat the in Bodega that cat. game. Yeah. So. <laughs> but so yeah, I, Bodega needs a cat. If there's not a cat at a Bodega, walk out. Exactly. <laughs> so but yes food, and then, food might be trash but yeah. doesn't matter it doesn't matter um and and thank you angelique because i think you have been affiliated with all of us in some way shape or form or we've been on the marvel podcast or something like that you know uh so shout out to you as well flowers for you as well oh uh, shout out to y'all because you know you make my job easy um, no, Stuart, like that's, I mean, that's actually one of the big things that I, I do love about this panel is that each one of you are, were brilliant before you came to the world of Wakanda. Like each one of you may have been influenced by Wakanda as fans, uh, picked up a Black Panther book, learned about, you know, some other part or just been in love with a writer that you realized had also done something with Black Panther and whether that's Don McGregor's run or Christopher Priest's run or being associated with ta run like there's been so much or even just Black Panther and the Avengers um or that one time that he took over as Daredevil <laughs> you know the- that was okay run oh, look put some respect on Sean Martin bro's was- name Sean Sean Drew's no initiative. it's okay I just wasn't ready for him to take over as Daredevil like I just didn't eh. <laughs> the run was great. I was just like, okay, all right, this is what we're gonna do. Choices were made. Um, I also just think Daredevil was like so much less morality on like taking folks out than T'Challa Look, does sometimes. Matt, Matt, Matt has a lot of Catholic guilt he has to work through, and you know, as a Catholic, that's how he I does it. Completely understand. Uh, yeah. So that being said, I, I kind of want to start. You know, each of you have created a piece of this world, right? But there were actual roadmaps. And one of the roadmaps that I love so much is the work that Billy Graham did and the work that other folks have done to not just give us characters in this this, this blind world, right? Where we just kind of see snippets or vignettes of Uh, a palace or snippets and vignettes of water, but we really can visualize what Wakanda looks like. And if we were walking around Wakanda, you know, pull out and go, oh, that's the Great Mound. Or, you know, know, Evan, you've done so much historical work um, filling in the blanks. Uh, Because as we know, like Black Panther actually didn't spend a lot of time in Wakanda in the first years that he um, was a character. He actually spent most of his time in New York. Um, And so we really didn't get to know Wakanda until Don McGregor's run and Billy Graham coming in, but we still, it still had told. So for you, you've worked on the history, whether it is looking at the Kings and the rise of the Black Panther, and now with the mapping, like one, how dope is that to be able a person who like loves this so much to be able to go, oh, I get to I get to help fill in the blanks. But two, talk to folks about why that kind of work is important, particularly as you're world building this fictional country that means so much to so many. Yeah. Um, and you know, thank you, Angelique, obviously, for the nice things you're saying. Um the thing about the the jungle action run, um, the, where Billy Graham was the artist, and you know, for folks who don't know who Billy Graham is, he's a legendary pioneering uh, comic book artist, um, one of the first uh, black comic book artists to kind of achieve superstar status. He drew um, the jungle action run with Black Panther. He was also one of the first seminal artists on Luke Cage, so he's touched a lot of the icons that we all um, are familiar with now. Um, and he was an, also an early art director, too, I want to say, at EC Comics, um, or maybe it was Warren. Um, anyway, so the thing about that run is, um, you know, like you said, um, uh, Black Panther was kind of a tertiary, second-level character in his earliest appearances, right? He was a quasi-villain in Fantastic Four, and then he was a member of the Avengers, but always kind of in the background. 
So him taking the spotlight in um, Jungle Action really gave him room, uh, gave the character room to grow in the ways that like we take for granted with other characters, right? We got to see Wakanda as a place that had its own internal culture, that had its own like internal tensions, you know? Like the idea that they were isolationists was first introduced in that run, right? And so as that the isolationist mindset took issue with um, their king going around gallivanting with all these white folk from outside the country. Like, what are you like, what are you doing? We, we're not about this. Um, so, you know, tapping into that um, in, in my various like forays in, in Wakanda has been fun. Um, the idea that like Wakanda has a national mindset, right? And that there are variations uh, along that, right? So it's like, yeah, we see the people in the palace a lot because they're the kings and the superheroes and the queens and whatnot. Um, but we also don't see people from the rank and file, right? What what do those people feel like? You know, what does it mean when a king comes from the most humble beginnings, right? As we've seen in some um, Black Panther stories. Um, what does it mean for Wakanda to like have to uh, execute diplomacy with their neighbors, right? Like, um, so the thing that's unique about Wakanda as a fictional construct is that it's a sovereign nation, right? And it's a Black sovereign nation that avoided colonialism. So, you know, that is just like such rich material to write uh, around and write into. Um, I think, you know, especially when it coming from a Black diaspora background, you know, whether you're coming from the Caribbean like me or from like, uh, if you're Black European or Black American, like everybody has a, uh, has a perspective on what it means to like, um, control your own agency and define your own blackness within the parameters of societies you live. And we all bring that to Wakanda, right? Like, you know, my boy Adam Serwer wrote a, a story in uh, The Marvel's Voices Wakanda Forever that was all about, again, this hidden international history that you don't necessarily see with Wakanda or expect to see with Wakanda. But like, yeah, people within Wakanda have their own ideas about what could what they could be doing in the outside world and that's a relatively new development in the mythos of Wakanda so you know doing the world building I think a part of it is thinking about the world that we live in every day and thinking about what could we use to amplify the fantastical nature of Wakanda and 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 therefore deepen you know all the kinds of thinking that make up this really amazing fictional place Sorry, I feel like I went on too long there, but yeah. No, I think I think it's a perfect segue into my question for Cherie. So, you know, going into this first run of Black Panther, right? Well, the first solo run, you know, infamous, infamously, Don McGregor looks at a, a reprint line called Jungle Action. And what folks don't understand is we live in a world where there's a direct market, which means we can go find the books we want to find. We can, you know, go look them up. There are back issues. We now have digital encyclopedic, like encyclopedic um, places where we can go, I want issues such and such of this line. And nine times out of 10, we can find it. But back then, everything was sold on a newsstand. As soon as it was obsolete, it either got the cover taken off and got sent back or it got burnt or whatever the process was at that time. But, you know... At this point in time, Marvel's like, we're going to start reprinting some of our old stories because people haven't seen them before. Um, <laughs> and there was a re reprint line called Jungle Action. And again, infamously, Don McGregor goes, I don't understand why we have this book set in Africa and there's no Black heroes in it and the white people keep saving the Black people. This doesn't really make sense at this day and age at all. Um, for those who are familiar with Jungle Action, at least these reprints were better than the uh, originals. Um, and Let's so see. at... <laughs> they so don't hold up the... well. <laughs> they don't. They do not stand the test of time. Um, but, you know, Cherie, Don has also said he never thought that people would be going back and reprinting Panther's Rage, let alone turning it into a book. And so you get this opportunity to one, take which, what was at first just half of a comic book, right? And eventually slowly but surely takes over the whole comic book, but you get to take these stories and almost fill in the blanks um, to move the characters through these paces. Like, what was it like? And what do you think was important to you stepping into this project? 
Oh, it was pretty exciting um, um, to be asked. I was very, very thrilled. It's actually my very first novel that I've done, um, beginning, middle, and end that I like. <laughs> so, um, so that was pretty amazing. And to be able to go back and 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 as Evan said, to go back and go through the, that those pioneers' work and to use that as your you know the foundation. What was important to me was to write the novel in the spirit of the comics that we love, um, that try to capture some of the fun of Don's prose, which is very I think non traditional for comics, right? He's very much a uh, lyricist or what have you, but also to bring back Monica Lynn in a way that made sense for a 21st century audience, you know? Um, and to bring, as, as, as was discussed earlier, the people of Wakanda more vividly into the storylines. Um, we, we already know that um, T'Challa has been gone from his kingdom for some time, you know, on his adventures with the Avengers. He's grieving, but not really kind of addressing that. Um, he's very still much angry. So he's going through the stages of grief that you go when you lose a loved one. And in this case, we all know that his father was murdered, right, by Klaus. So it leaves a, a leadership vacuum in Wakanda. Um, and so that when he is called back, it is not under the best circumstances at all. And of course, his new love that he wants to, you know, introduce to the kingdom. Nobody is feeling this woman. <laughs> it's like, where have you been? Uh, we need you. Who is this woman? She's not Wakandan. Um, and, you know, and, and, and now everything is going um, awry. So for me, it was very important to get the spirit of the original comics, you know, in the novel, but also to bring a bit of you know the the world that has intervened since those comics were created in there we think about um our relationships in a different ways that was then um he's not just a a, a tribal chieftain right of a village you know wakanda is uh it's you know it's fleshed out as a, a far more advanced technologically advanced place it has a huge geography i wish i'd had the atlas book <laughs> <laughs> oh my god we all yeah do. <laughs> that would have been amazing because i actually kind of created my own you know pulled together from all the um you know the maps that were available at the time um before, before they released the atlas book but um and also to create some new spaces and new characters which of course i had permission to do so um from the wonderful team at marvel so that was pretty overwhelming um life-changing in a lot of ways um and um also nerve-wracking let's let's be real <laughs> about that always always yeah <laughs> right? yeah it, it's, right? it's terrifying <laughs> no there's a level there's a level of importance uh for so many now that wakanda holds um regardless of where you're from and the more we get of Wakanda and the more inclusive Wakanda gets of the Black diaspora, the more important and precious I think it becomes. And I think this is really important as we look at the new generation, right? We look at um, how young folks see themselves within this world. And Fred, you had the opportunity to write this really powerful children's book. Um, that not only um, reflects, you know, wh where we've all been, where we've all said what we want to grow up to be, you know, but also reflects having uh, a powerful example of what we want to do. Like, what does it look like then when you are not only getting a chance to expose young people to this dream on screen through your work with the Wakanda Challenge, Black Panther Challenge, but also now being able to basically write a bedtime story. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was <laughs> such a moment, um, or it is still such a moment because you know a lot of a lot of my work, um, my other books are centered around you know teaching things and helping us grow as a society. And this was actually my first book to kind of like launch me into a direction of my career where I'm just like. I want us to find hope. And I think that specifically with this book, because it ties to the film, the challenge was 
how do you remind kids or even teach kids that Wakanda is T'Challa, but it's also so much more than that, right? And so, you know, what I wanted to do was create a story about a new character who is a reminder of that, right? Like, whether it's Shuri, whether it's T'Challa, whether it's uh, Ramonda, who I, at the time, I did not know passed in the film. So I'm very, <laughs> I am very happy that I wrote a hopeful book. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so, but, you know, what, what our goal is, is to remind children of what we are working for, right? I think so often things are so heavy around us that, and, and it's a heavy film, right? So like at some point you have to remind people like, where is the joy? So I wanted to write a book that at the center of Wakanda is not just aspiration or the, or, or, you know, not being colonized and, and, and kind of like these, you know, Afrofuturist ideals around political social issues. There's just joy. There's just black joy at the center um, of Wakanda. And I wanted to capture that in the book um, in something that kids can have and hold dear for years to come. Because I think that's that's what all of the writers, everyone on here, right, has tried to do in all your, your individual work. And I just wanted that for five, six, seven-year-olds, et cetera. And I love that because I don't know if folks, as you've been listening, there's this there is literally a reflection of power and strength and possibility for however you identify. You know, one of the things that I kind of want to also highlight, like Don McGregor is also responsible for creating two of the first gay male characters um, that were in Wakanda, that Danny Lore did such an incredible job letting them live their possibility um, last year in Marvel's Voices Pride. And it was something that, you know, Danny and I were like, yo, we gotta do this. This has to happen. Just to like let 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 it come full circle, you know. But also there's this idea of what does it look like for children? Like there's beautiful stories like Natasha Bustos' story, which was the first time they wrote and drew, and it's this beautiful festival day where a young, you know, a young person learns they have magic, right? There's all of these different aspects, like Nick Stone writing. Um, her trilogy about Shuri getting to be a kid. Like, you know, when we first meet Shuri, Shuri is already a teenager going on into being a young, we never get to meet Shuri as a child. We never look at Shuri's friendships and what that development looks like. You know, we basically see Shuri, Shuri dies, Shuri comes back to life. Like, it's just, you don't get to see that other part of the character's development, which is so important. And, you know, another aspect of this um, in, is you know when we first meet the Dora Milaje or the Dora Milaje, however you choose to say it. I say Milaje. I am from Louisiana. I too. So huh? <laughs> country. Um, but you know, we see them in a very different tone when we first get them in their first run. Um, it was the '90s, and I will just leave it there. Um, but we don't really get to find out much about them for the next decade or so. They pop up in storylines here and there. You maybe have three Dora Milaje that have names um, that are recognizable. Some of them are like retroactively given names and pulled forward. But, you know, in ta Coates's run, with the help of Roxane Gay, we get a much more fleshed out image of these strong um, badass, like I don't have another, like strong, brilliant philosopher, warrior, badass, like multifaceted women. And then Tara Mahorn, you get this opportunity to go, I'm gonna make this all make sense, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> because I, I will say that like, and not a, comics is a team sport. Different people write comics all the time. There are lots of gaps, which is both the pros and cons in comics. Because it means there's still stories left to tell. But there are those of us now, Evan, Cherie, Fred, Karma, everybody that's on this panel, who have to go back and go, all right, so how do we make all of this make sense while honoring the work of the people that came before us? And so you were able to make badass women more badass? <laughs> yeah, no, it was, 
where do you start with this? Um, uh, rum, a lot of rum. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> a lot of crying. Um, no, I was very excited to take this on um, with Protectors of Wakanda. And then, but I was also terrified, but I knew I had to do it because of how important it was. Because most black women comic book characters, like most black women, are often ignored and seen, but not heard. And so the whole history of these characters, they've been in the room for just about every major thing that's happened to T'Challa, T'Chaka, and, and the entire line of Black Panthers, but nobody ever really talks to them. Um, I do think, obviously, even though a lot of the work that we did was with comics and prose, which is outside of the MCU, but we can't ignore the fact that 2018, um, except for Fred. Fred's book had everything to do with Wakanda Forever. Ours didn't, sorry. Uh, but <laughs> but um, we can't ignore the fact that 2018, Marvel actually was like, oh, there's a lot of interest here. Let's start creating things for this audience. And they were very smart to ask a lot of Black folks to start um, writing it. But I regularly tell people, like I am an African-American woman who wrote a story about fictional African characters coming from a fictional African country that was created by white men. So when you have those parameters, it sometimes gives you a small field of vision to work in. Um, and it's, it's a, that's the part that scared me. So what I did was, cause you, I think all of you know this, you never know, Marvel never tells you what you can't do until you, hit that fence. And they're like, yeah, you can't do that. Like, yeah. They're just like, yeah, give us your ideas. <laughs> and you just give all the ideas. And they're like, no, 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 no. So um, there are things that are in the book that I am so proud of. And I'm so, ex I mean, I am waiting to this day for somebody to call me and go, yeah, you know what? We can't let you do that because I, I'm, but I'm just so excited that I was able to play in this playground. So for me, it was, I did, there was so much that ta Coates and Roxane Gay and so many people did but I had to go back to Christopher Priest who created, you know, the character and then go back a little bit further to, you know, Don McGregor and then jump forward to Jonathan Mayberry and Jonathan Hickman. So I had to touch on, um, I found the biggest stories and the, and the biggest moments I felt in Wakanda in comic book history. Um, and I'm still paying that bill. Like comicsology has changed over to Amazon and I'm still paying them because there were so many <laughs> things that I bought. <laughs> But there was a lot of research because I had my faves. But then when you're asked to write something like this, which has got so much history in it, you got to, you know, that's research. So that was a, that was the scary part. I was like, because you know, if you're going to get it wrong, you're going to get dragged. I mean, I'm going to get dragged on Twitter either way. But you know, if you get it wrong, you get dragged for days. So I wanted to make sure that I got a lot of the, the facts right. And I was just so excited that they... A, let me include Doom War, Jonathan Mayberry's Doom War, because there were hundreds of Dora in that story. And I was also allowed to include, obviously, Tanhasi Coach Run, but I was also allowed to include uh, the basically history of the Black Panthers that it, it basically in extension, the ancestral line that. Um, Jonathan Hickman sort of introduced in Fantastic Four years ago when he when T'Challa became King of the Dead. I was able to include that, and then on top of that, the the two women, um, uh, queens, you know, Black Panthers, both Nahanda, who was created by um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and Takanda, who was created by Nnedi Okorafor. Um, I was so excited because. This meant like everybody who's touched this, I was able to give honor to their characters. So there's really only like two characters I created for this book. The majority of this book, oh no, three, sorry. I gotta, I gotta get better at that. Um, <laughs> but the majority of them, this was just me saying, okay, so you've read Reginald Hudlin's run um, for Azuri when he met the Howling Commandos, but there were Dora there, who were they? You know, yeah. you met, you know, when uh, we first, Christopher Priest wrote, first wrote about Okoye, everybody thought, you know, uh, she was a teenager. She wasn't. But how do we adjust that? 
you know, so there's all these little things that I got to answer. And also what happens when you age out? If you don't die on the battlefield, what do you do? What does a 65 year old Dora do? I, I had questions. So I was able to come up with answers to things and put them in a universe or a world where, listen, this is how they learn. This is how they train. And this is why they do what they do. This is why they have tattoos. This is what you do if you, for religious reasons, can't have a tattoo or you have to keep your head covered or you have to, like, I, I was thinking of the future and my goal was create canon and create versions of the Dora that hopefully somebody in the future in a comic book or in a show will be able to uh, pull from. I love it. All right, so we have what well, I am. I'm trying my best not to go down this rabbit hole with you because I have so many things I want to say about that. Um, because we have questions from the audience. Um, so I am going to go out of order just so uh, one uh, PK said, Can you kindly send your friend, me, PK, an autographed copy? Karma. I just wanted to get that one out of the way. <laughs> um, Oh, wait, the comic or the book? <laughs> the book. Okay. <laughs> Done. That's funny. You've got a request. Um, next, we're going to talk about, so I love Wakanda Forever. This is from Alex. I love Wakanda Forever, but it seems like some people struggled with it. How do y'all feel about the future of the Black Panther franchise in film? I cannot answer this. Please, panelists, do you feel like you can answer this? Because... Wow. Well, I, I personally don't think here's the thing I there are a lot of people that struggled with it but we also have to look at Marvel coming off of phase four also coming out of a pandemic and like people keep judging all these movies that came out when we were on lockdown when people had like all of these restrictions and they had to have closed sets with no more than five people on them at a time like can we just cut these people some slack first second there was a whole star of that movie that passed away and they had to course correct after principal photography, which is ridiculous. So just, I'm gonna let the creators create. Um, but to the two Haitians on the panel, three, uh, sorry, uh, we got a Haitian Black Panther now. So what say you? <laughs> I'm gonna go first. Uh, yeah. Um, First thing I'll say is if, if folks um, in attendance have not checked out the Wakanda Forever podcast that ta is um, writing and hosting, it's amazing. It's a really deep dive into the making of the movie. And I ain't getting paid for this. Um, I just think it's good. Um, and, and it makes me feel optimistic, you know? Like, look, as a vision holder, um, at least from a directorial perspective, Ryan cares. I feel like, you know, he cares about the mythos. He cares about... Um, what he puts into these stories, what, what what the studio's putting into these stories. And I think that shows, um, you know, it's it's a complex film, um, one that I happen to love, but um, I, I think um, the 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 intent um, and the emotion are, are sincere and valid. Um, and I think it's just gonna grow in different places. You know, I believe there's a show in production, right? For Disney Plus, um, we're gonna see more Wakanda there. And, you know, I, 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 I'm really optimistic about it. And, you know, as for the Haitian part, Young Prince Toussaint, um, you know, like, uh, I, I- You cried, I mean, Evan. Just say yes, it. You cried. I was, I was, you was, cried. I was, I was, Most of yeah. us cried when we Let, realized that boy's name was too- I was like- Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm not ashamed of that. Like, to say <laughs> that. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. I, it, I, you know, linking up Wakanda's fictional history of resistance with the actual real world history of Haitian resistance of revolution, like was inspired, like, you know, um, it was incredible. So I think, you know, one of the things that well, that, that that corner of the MCU is doing really well is um, uh, invoking an anti-colonial colonialist ethos, right? So, you know, uh, you rooted um, their adaptation of Namor, Namor, into an anti-colonialism, Wakanda is obviously there. So, you know, I think it's, I think that makes it the most interesting corner of the MCU geopolitically. And I feel like all these major storylines are gonna have to move or reckon with this alliance um, between um, Talokan and Wakanda. And I can't wait to see what happens there. So, you know, uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm in the bag, like I am in the bag, I'm hopeful about what, what's gonna happen next. 
All right, so we got to move on because I don't want to. I don't want to skip anybody's questions because I know we all have thoughts on this movie. But um, Shia, please, Shia. I hope I said that right. I'm so sorry if I didn't. Do you think Marvel's dominance of the comic industry limits or mutes independent comic story storytelling or invites new voices in? I think it invites new voices in. Um, I think you also have to look at Marvel today is not Marvel 20 years ago. It's actually not Marvel 10 years ago. Um, and and I and I'm the only reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, I wrote an article literally eight years ago complaining that Marvel didn't have any black writer black women writers and didn't wasn't paying attention to its huge contingent of black female fans specifically and look how many we have now and I'm also one of them so you can't um, <clears throat> it can't I I want us to look at where we are now and see that there are people that write in both worlds. There are people that write indie that also write it for the big two. And it doesn't have to be either or. And in fact, sometimes some of the money from one is helping to supplement the other. So that, that cause it's all about the next gig. So that that's my concept. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna look at the site guys. I see you in the comments. All right. Uh... Is Karama's lip shade an exclusive heart shaped herb color? And do we have to go to Wakanda to get it? Asking for a friend. Karama, you are literally just getting all the questions right now. All right. I'm going <laughs> to let Karama answer that in the chat. I'll do um, the chat. That's hilarious. Okay. So, Talisha, I love these ideas and the concept of Wakanda being this diverse, nuanced entity. Do you all think audiences will learn more about Wakanda on the big screen or will re remain transmediated? For the record, I think transmedia storytelling is beautiful and love and admire all your contributions. Oh. I mean. I mean, I could jump at this, but um, I think just from a scale question, you know, more people are going to see the movies and TV than are, are going to show up in comic shops. But if you do go to a movie theater or watch it on your couch, please go to a comic shop because that's where everything starts, right? It's the epicenter of this, of these concentric circles, which are now reverberating throughout the culture, right? So, um, um, and again, I'm not, this is not just like buy my comics. It's like buy some comics, like uh, support the ecosystem from which these ideas come from. So, you know, uh, and realize that you know the comics are more than just source material. They are their own um, stories and sagas um, unto themselves. And honestly, one of the things that comics can do that the uh, big budget transmedia adaptations cannot is like uh, they can get funky and experimental. They can, you know, you can stay in a corner of Wakanda that that's never going to get shown on screen and be like wholly entertained um, in a comic in a way that you know budgetary considerations sometimes. Or, or whatever larger um, order of operation stuff is not necessarily going to green light. So um, the comics are a really wild, crazy landscape of storytelling, um, not just for Black Panther, but throughout the whole medium. And, you know, go there, um, but come back, go to the other places, but come back to comics. I agree. I agree. Um, so this is for all of you. What advice would you give to aspiring Black POC writers looking to push boundaries within the predominantly white comic book space. Hmm. Okay, well, first start. Like, I don't know if yeah. you're, I don't know if you're a writer or an artist. The person that asked the question, but start. Don't ever say I'm not going to start because of white people. Because <laughs> just no. <laughs> so just first start. Get it out. Just any way you can. Just start. Um, I also don't know if it's necessary to do that anymore, but I'll let the rest of the audience, the, the panel answer that. Cherie, Renee, Fred, thoughts? Uh, um, Cherie, go ahead. Personally, I don't want to write for projects in which I'm asked to flatten my blackness. So I think it's a different time period for us as artists. When I first joined this field 30 years ago, that was, not necessarily overtly said, but it was done in terms of how things were edited sometimes. And it was also done in the matter of, oh, this is for book clubs, or we're trying to hit this list, or we want to reach this kind of audience. Can you do this to your characters? I believe um, um, 
that um, Kaisi Lehman has written and spoken about that experience that he had writing his novels and, um, and the effect that it had on him. So I would say, bring your whole self to the page, bring your whole self to the work. Um, and Marvel, as you can see from all of these various projects is very, very open to other ideals and ways of being and working with writers on creating work that sounds authentic, that feels authentic, that comes out of the culture. Uh, we are writing about black superhero, right? In an African nation, a, a futuristic nation in so many ways, right? And so how are you gonna do that if you're not really featuring the things of the culture, you know, and not on a, not in a kind of a check a box kind of way, but in a deeper multi-layered nuanced way. And that's been very fun and exciting. So bring your full self to the page, write long enough to discover your voice, read widely like a writer. If there are things that give you a visceral response to the reading, go back and read it again to see what technique, how did they do that dialogue? What words did they use? Um, how did they paint this scene so efficiently, right? You know, how do you do action, <laughs> you know, without it becoming repetitive? I had a great editor that I work with that, that helped me on that. Um, if you're not yourself a superhero who is doing uh, <laughs> the martial arts on a regular basis, like someone like Stephen Barnes, for example, who has a physical life and, and, and history and language of choreography and things like that, and what really hurts on the body and how the body responds to pain, you know? So do your due diligence as a writer, hold on to the things that makes you unique, read, read, read widely, um, and, and communicate and build community, build community, because we find out a lot of things from each other um, who tap you on the shoulder, excuse me, tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we're doing this. Would you be interested in this? Or we saw that you like to do this. This is something you've been doing a long time. This is a great opportunity that you might be interested in. So that's really important as well. I love it. All right, I think we have time for maybe two more questions, short ones. Um, one from Clarence Young, do y'all see Wakanda expanding to, to be the younger generation Star Trek, ex, uh, inspiring social, technological, and economic change in the real world? Well, I think it's so possible. I, I, I mean, <laughs> for people who are really like into that, you know, you, you go through, you read these comics and you're like, oh, I know that, um, we have our cell phones today, right? They came out of, you know, fans watching Star Trek or what have you. You know, we have the MP3 player that came out of, you know, watching an episode with data. And, you know, that's a relationship between the sciences, innovation, and the, our space program and comics has a long, long history and, and connection in terms of scientists, you know, thinking about things outside of their work in comic spaces and experimenting, people who are also um, into, you know, the art, going into the sciences, that's a, just a great relationship. So if we can create some other ways of being, not just technology, not as Nalo Hopkinson says, boys with toys, right? But, um, but also some philosophical strategies, perhaps, um, ways of, you know, how do you, how are you diplomatic in this situation, right? How do you build community across cultures? You know, um, what, what needs to be preserved and protected and what can we share with the world? Lots of ways to think about this in terms of, of innovations coming out of Wakanda that aren't necessarily technology and not just about war and battling and fighting um, good versus evil, but also how do we build beautiful neighborhoods that we are interested in living in and pass on things from one generation to the next, right? I see that as also coming out of the stories of the world of Wakanda. And also, I just want to add really quick to what Cherie said. You know, we often think about in modern times as technology as something being electronic and digital and whatnot, but like group work is a technology, folkways are a technology, like oral storytelling and history keeping is a technology, right? So all those things have um, a purpose for how we live our lives. And, you know, the, the, in, I think in the best stories about Wakanda and Black folks, like those things um, can have a role to play too. I love it. All right, so last question. I'm gonna start off with Fred, quickly answered. 
Uh, but I want I wanted to get this out to y'all because and I feel like Fred and you and I have talked about the possibilities of telling more stories um, from SM Long. What other stories would you like to tell within the Wakanda world that haven't been told before? No, oh, puppy. Thanks, thanks. Uh, this is Dumal. Hi, guys. I, I think that's really interesting. Um, I would love to see more of a hyper focus on the ordinary, right? The daily lives of Wakandans. You know, oftentimes um, when we look at this universe that's been created, uh, you know, we focus on the Doras, we focus on who's becoming Black Panther, and we've even focused on some of the socioeconomic, geopolitical issues. Um, but one of the things I want to see is like, kids running around right like and i think that i think nick did a great job with that as you said with shuri um with her shuri trilogy right like what does it look like to just be a wakandan kid right and i think that in many ways um that would be radical right like what does it look like to be in love like i would love to see a rom-com come out of the wakandan universe right like something that doesn't have to do um with superheroes whatsoever just two Wakandans who happen to be in love and the backdrop is we have a vibranium protected uh, nation, right? Like, but I just want to see two people fall in love and let that be that. Oh man, I love, 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 love this question. I want, I tried to do this in the Panther's Rage novel, definitely children playing and what the playgrounds would look like in Wakanda, especially in the capital city, right? What does it look like in the Golden City? But I absolutely want to see what are the Wakandan clubs? What are they rocking? What's the fashion? You know, what are they, you know, um, maybe a mystery series coming out of Wakanda, like, you know, like a detective series, like what, what are the everyday concerns of Wakandans? Like, what does the graffiti look like? You know, we saw a little bit of that in the movie, right? Which was so exciting to see, you know, the, the world kind of unfold before our eyes, but, you know, just kind of going in there, do they wear school uniforms? You know, <laughs> you know, I, I have, you know, friends who are Haitian and I look at their old photographs from their elders and they're in their blue that, you know, that, that dark blue uniform, like what, what is it like um, for regular people who aren't a part of the, the royal palace, who aren't a part of the military and the intrigue, but who are like, you know, selling, you know, essence oil at the market, whatever. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Karma, and then we'll go to Evan. Um, I kind of want to see two things. I want to see, because I'm so intrigued by this child that grew up in Haiti, in the, in the movies, but it's also the a child of Wakanda. So I want to see both. I want to see a bilingual child. I want to see a kid that gets to be a kid, but he still has these responsibilities. It's like, oh, but he's got friends and that are in Port-au-Prince and he's got friends that are in um, uh, Wakanda. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is small. I just want them to have last names. Um, something I've, every time I have a meeting with Marvel, I ask if anybody in Wakanda can have a last name because everybody African I know has about seven names. And uh, every, we know Thor's entire family line. Um, and, they, and they started it a little bit in the movie we, with, you know, Lupita, daughter of Yah kind of thing. Uh, but nobody in Wakanda has a last name. And it's just one of those things that once we are allowed to give them families and family lines and family lineages, and maybe that's the next thing we can, then they will be the canon I feel like will be complete because then you can start telling stories about ancestors and things like that. But yeah, the one thing that's always made me absolutely crazy is that they don't have any last names. All right, Evan. Um, uh, man, uh, Following up all of that from from y'all, um, I think I think the thing that really interests me is um, the tension between um, the technological bent of a lot of what we see in Wakanda and you know what are these people's faith practices? We know you know they worship Bast, right? You know um, what what is this? What is the spiritual life of Wakandans and different factions of Wakanda? You know, in the comics there are different factions, in the movies there are different factions. So how does that differ? Where do you find commonality? um and you know uh how has that kept that that spiritualism kept them to be ferocious and sovereign and independent for all these centuries so yeah ah yeah. uh, 
All right. So I just want to thank everyone for coming to this panel. I'm always delighted to spend so much time uh, with these amazing, brilliant folks. But I want to encourage each one of you um, to follow every single one of these folks. Check out their work, their books, um, and their future works, because I know there are stuff y'all cannot tell us about that y'all are currently working on. Um, but also I want to encourage all the attendees to make sure you're checking out the rest of Virtuous Con. Make sure you're checking out the vendor flow, uh, the vendor floor uh, show by clicking the links in the chat because we want to make sure we are supporting folks. Um, because I think that's one of the things I, I would I hope that you all get from this is that, you know, Evan said it in making sure you go and pick up the comics. You know, Fred talked about the idea of philanthropy. You know, Cherie, you know, spoke about this idea of making sure Blackness is prevalent in our work. Um, and Karima, I know, has been supporting folks from day one and is part of this incredible, incredible event in bringing people together. And I, I want you to walk away in understanding is the way we get more folks like the ones on this panel is by supporting folks like the ones who are on this panel and by going out there and doing the work. Uh, so please make sure you're supporting the artists. Um, please make sure you're reaching out to the artists. And, you know, if you are an artist, just start building. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wakanda forever. <laughs>